This is Maker Galaxy. We're always talking about the future of design, the future of technology, the future of making. In a world where personal Bluetooth environment trackers can sync real-time weather data to a smartphone. A world where motion tracking heaters can follow a user as they move throughout a building. How do we find the next big thing? Maker Galaxy is a show that explores the crossroads of design, technology, and the future of making. Welcome to the show, everybody. I'm your host, Simon Martin, and this week we talked CAD in the Cloud and Internet Privacy with Andy Kale of Ghostery. Andy is the Director of Research of the popular web privacy tool that allows users to block third-party trackers and protect their private information. We'll talk with Andy about the basics of Internet Privacy, how CAD in the Cloud is affected by trackers, as well as some precautions you can take to make sure that yours and your clients' data is safe in the cloud. Today's episode is brought to you by the new Objet 500 Connects 3 from Stratasys, the world's only color and multi-material 3D printer. Offering incomparably brilliant and consistent colors, Plus transparent colors, the Objet 500 Connects 3 lets you create the most true-to-life modeling possible. Find out more at Stratasys.com. Welcome, Andy. We'll get into ghostery in a little bit, but before we do, we want to know, where can we find the best ice cream shop on Earth and what should we get there? Oh, man, the best ice cream shop on Earth. So this is a... This is going to be a weird one, but it's called Lofty Pursuits. It's like a hobby store and old-timey <laughs> soda fountain in Tallahassee, Florida. And they have this sundae that's made with uh, chocolate and hot pepper ice cream. And it's got like candied, candied jalapenos on it. Wow. Uh, it is off the charts. Um, that's where I grew up in, in North Florida. And, and that place is... Absolutely amazing. I, I, I have a lot of family there and stuff. I might miss Lofty Pursuits the most. <laughs> I mean, it's, <laughs> it's, it's 10 in the morning. I'm, I have not had breakfast yet, and I find myself strangely craving an ice cream sundae from that place right now. <laughs> yeah, it's pre- pretty good. Pretty good. Excellent. So now, you studied anthropology and religion during your time in school before diving headfirst into the wild and crazy world of advertising. How did this happen? Um, I, I actually think there's a lot of uh, a lot a lot of overlap there. I, I, you know, as <laughs> as probably a lot of uh, budding anthropologists would tell you, uh, people in, in all sorts of professions could probably do do themselves well by by studying culture. Um, but I, I became interested in uh, the sort of online uh, space and particularly the way that that advertising sort of fuels content online as an extension of that, because I was looking at um, how we represent ourselves online as, as its own sort of digital culture. And uh, so it was a a couple of steps. Some people might say slippery ones, but um, (laughs) I I sort of ended up firmly in the, uh, in the online advertising and transactional transactional data realm. Excellent. And so let's, let's back up even a little further then how can you tell us a little bit about your background, pre-advertising and pre-school? I mean, how, how did you know you wanted to go in this direction? Yeah, so I started working, uh, it, my, my first sort of exposure to any of this at all was actually in, in print. I was working at um, a series of print shops as, as they kind of moved into more digital printing opportunities, right? So uh, so print shops um, used to be, you know, big, big giant rooms of, um full of full of a press and and there was all this sort of uh very alchemical process for setting things up and um old grumpy guys who were the only ones who knew how to do it right and then as it as it moved into like the digital world as digital um opportunities for printing became more um available uh that opened up the door to all sorts of um data driven opportunities so in a at a time where it used to be you had to set up one particular image and make 
thousands and thousands of that same postcard in order for it to be cost effective. Now it was a world where based on any information I had about you, I could print you something individually that, that made sense to you. So maybe instead of just saying, Hey, come test drive a car, I could send you a postcard that said, Hey, come test drive a, the, the new version of your car. And here's a picture of it. Right. Right. Um, so, so it, there were all of these opportunities. So that's, that was sort of my first, um, peek into the, into the idea of kind of uh, this new data driven world. And I watched how it was really reforming what was, what is maybe like, you know, one of the most, one of the staple sort of old world industries, which is, you know, a printing press. Right. right. And, uh, and so, so it was, it was really changing that entire industry. And so that, that got me really interested in, and this was at the same time where I was, I was in school and, and I had I had begun kind of dabbling in the ideas of anthropology and cultural studies until I they got me really interested in the idea about how this data, how like a quantified world would change the way or the way we looked at culture, the way we behaved with one another. So um, it was all sort of an integrated an integrated process. There, it was, it was kind of a natural kind of a natural progression. Definitely, and it's it's funny how you were describing the the print process and how we're seeing basically that exact same thing happening today with 3D printing. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, manufacturing is being, uh, you know, on the cusp of that sort of total digital revolution there. Absolutely right. Definitely. And so from advertising, how did you find your way into data science? Um, well, it was, it was really the other way around. I re really from data-driven uh, studies, I found my way into advertising. So um, I had a, I, I, my first, job in the space was with a company called Right Media, um, who was then bought by Yahoo. Uh, but the Right Media was an early, uh, what we call an advertising exchange, which is um, the idea of allowing different advertising networks to partner together so that instead of just having sort of a group of advertisers that are your clients and a group of sites that are your clients, and you provide the technology to match advertisements between those site, those, those brands and those sites, Exchanges let you also add to your partnerships other networks. So now you've got a whole stable of advertisers, and then the sites that are available to you are the sites that are your clients and clients of your partner networks, and it works the other way around as well. So there was a ton of transactional data about what got passed where and whose ads showed up where and which networks needed a, uh, you know, a slice of the dollars that were traded and all that kind of stuff. Um, there was just this enormous amount of, of data. And because it was a platform where all these different networks could work together, there had to be some sort of easy standard of, uh, of uh, you know, understanding what was, what was being traded, what, what made sense, you know, it had to make sense to everybody, uh, all the players involved. So um, the advertising part of it was really, uh, you know, a, a secondary notion. I, I started sort of, by looking at that transactional data and doing that kind of analysis. And then um, you can sort of only escape the world in which you are for so long, right? So right. I, uh, <laughs> I um, you know, began to learn more and more about how these companies worked and, and the kinds of data they were trading. And so then my job gradually morphed from um, just doing low-level data analysis, you know, that low-level transactional analysis into like, uh, you know, more product level and design level stuff around how the data was being used, how it could better be represented, all that kind of thing. And then, you know, now obviously at Ghostream, my, my job is uh, almost entirely observational and be, as we don't participate in the advertising portion of it at all, but um, we, we have a kind of big picture view of the way the whole system works. Definitely. And you just kind of led us into my next question for you, which is you are working uh, with Ghostery. For those who might not know, what is Ghostery and who is it for? So we have a consumer, a free consumer tool that works inside whatever web browser you're already using, and it shows you all the companies that are collecting data and using data about you when you visit a website. Um, even, even now, a lot of people just sort of, when they put in a website, they think, okay, well, I'm interacting with just this one website, but um, most websites have a, a many, many partners, sometimes several dozen partners also on that site, making their own calls to their own servers and collecting their own data as part of that. So what we try to do is just make the whole process more transparent, give individual users a better understanding of what is, um, 
what's happening and then allow you a meaningful choice, meaning we let you block that activity if you want. So, um, it's, it, those are the, those are the sort of, sort of stalwarts of the product is, um, transactional transparency. We want you to see what's happening when it's happening. We want to give you relevant information about what's going on so you can understand who those companies are and what kinds of data they're, they're collecting. And then that meaningful choice, giving you the opportunity to stop that activity if, if you want. So then on the, so that's on our consumer side, but then consumers can opt into sharing information with us about what they're seeing and where they're seeing it. It's anonymous information that isn't the same kinds of data that these companies are collecting. Rather, it's data about those companies. And then we can help sites and brands and the companies in that group better understand their relationships with each, with each other uh, and evaluate each other as partners and things of that nature. So we have, we have products on both sides, the consumer product for transparency just in how you're browsing and then the enterprise product for transparency in terms of auditing those relationships. And so the enterprise product is where you're profitable then? That's correct. Yeah, the consumer product is free. Uh, the, the only way that it's supported is if you opt in to share that data with us and, and that's off by default and you, it works the same way whether you opt in or not. We don't want to make that data sharing, even the anonymous kind, compulsory, right? right. So, um, but then we have uh, millions of people who have opted in to share that data with us, which gives us this kind of census view. So that's a unique look at the way things actually work out in the wild, which we package into reports that companies are willing to buy. So that's where we that's where we make our money. Okay, now I understand that your focus is on advertising and data collection, or at least that's your background. But in terms of the the world of CAD and the cloud, companies such as Autodesk have been pushing to make product design projects infinitely accessible to a wide amount of task handlers. For example, a team designing headphones might have an industrial design crew working on an iteration that is then sent off to the mechanical engineering crew, and all of this information is shared openly across the company via the cloud. Yeah. So what is the first thing that comes to your mind about this new way of working in product design? Well, I mean, really, in the, the, one of the interesting thing that we're seeing, sort of a, a trend that's established is that the, the way in which content is, is supported online um, is generally advertising-based, right? Not a lot of us have subscriptions for content um, online. Most of us take advantage of free services or news sites or whatever that, that are supported by advertising. But in a similar fashion, this enti- the entire sort of delivery of that advertising is all, is all cloud-based. So it's not, you know, it's not a scenario where, say, Toyota specifically picks which sites they want to be on, designs ads specifically for that site, or their agency designs ads specifically for that site, and then they're placed there in front of you. That's a very small portion of the way advertising works online. The rest of it is all part of where, as as a website designer, I can just drop a small piece of code in, and I know that it's going to show an ad. And I'm going to do my best to... um, make sure my content is optimized for the, for the most money possible. But then the entire working behind the, the steps that are taken between that small piece of code and the ad that's actually delivered is this entire sort of cloud-based um, ecosystem where this uh, an enormous amounts of data are traded, lots of money is traded, and that's completely sort of separate from the people that that we think of when we think of the advertising process, which is, whoever the ad is for and wh- whichever site it shows up on. Right. So that, that entire, that entire industry, which is really the underpinnings of the economic system, the web is entirely, is entirely cloud-based now. And, but what about, what about privacy concerns? Like, uh, for example, uh, I, I have confidential information. I'm working on a headphone design that I don't want competitors to see. I mean, what, is there any sort of, pitfalls you can see in in this this new concept as somebody who works in online privacy yeah so that's why we really trumpet the notion of transparency right because you have to be aware of the trade-off so exactly it, particularly when these services are free um I, I have this thing that i call the silicon rule which is uh if the product is free then you are the product right so um the idea of using a free service and thinking that you're not trading anything for that service is, is just a naive idea. So you have to be very clear uh, and very sort of um, 
careful to make sure that the, that the services that you're using do not have access to your proprietary information as part of use of the service. Um, and I think that in lots of, in lots of ways, uh, that's something that gets, that gets missed that people don't, um, people aren't, don't scrutinize very frequently. They, they see a, a service that seems useful and, and they jump on it and as well they should. And many companies have very responsible ways of collecting data to monetize this. Um, but as, as designers or as idea owners, if you're not aware of exactly how much information that you're sharing, uh, you know, you can find yourself in a position where you, you've compromised uh, a lot more than, than you realized. So what about uh, if, I, if I did pay for a, a product like Fusion 360, uh, Autodesk's Premier Cat in the Cloud Answer, mm -hmm. people pay uh, $50 a month to use the service. So are they still at the mercy of Autodesk? Yeah, so I'm, I'm not familiar with exactly what the end user license agreement for that for that product is, right? Um, almost all in user license agreements allow companies to collect data for the sake of making the product better. Um, but frequently those kinds of privacy policies and those kinds of disclosures are there to protect the company should um, an attorney general come calling or should there be some sort of, you know, uh, uh, damages. And so like the, the common example is like if you use tax software and you do it incorrectly and, and you have to pay penalties, um, the end user license agreement for that tax software keeps you from being able to blame, you know, to sue that company for those penalties. Right. So um, that's what most of those end user license agreements are for. And the result of that is that they reserve the right to collect all sorts of information. Now, again, I can't speak specific. I'm not familiar specifically with um, the fusion 360 agreement, but I'm almost, uh, but I can be fairly certain that there's a provision in there that says, you know, we're going to collect user data. We're going to collect data about what you're working on in order to improve the product. And that is a fairly permissive clause, right? So that's why we advocate for the notion of transparency. Those kinds of protective statements, I understand they're a, pro they're a way to do business, but what we're, what we're beginning to push for is the idea of a privacy policy or a license agreement as a legal document, and then a transparency statement that says, here's, here's what we actually do, right? The, our, our privacy policy and license agreement are going to allow us to do a whole bunch of stuff because our legal department says we have to have that. But here's, a, here's an expression of what we're actually collecting, how we're actually using it, just so that a user can have that sort of informed uh, position, right, and they can they can make a choice that way. If, if I was using Ghostery while working on a browser-based CAD project, how what how would Ghostery help me in an online CAD program? So, if there are other third parties that are marketing-based tools that are embedded in that online program, Ghostery would show you how frequently those tools are being called. So, these tools can be all sorts of things, right? Um, analytics uh, tools are typically third party. So a company will collect sort of basic statistical information about how frequently you're using and how long your sessions are and where you're browsing from and things like that. Right. Uh, so Google analytics is an extremely popular uh, tool that you'll find just about everywhere on the web. And, and then as the, as the owner of the, of the web-based service, then I can go log in and Google will take all this information and, um, sort of build some reports out of it for me so I can better understand who my audience is, how they're using my tool, right? Um, so so in, in, any, in any case where those types of things are embedded into the product, Ghostry would give you visibility into, uh, into that uh, activity. And, and so do you think that freelance designers who might not have as much as a, a budget for uh, online security measures compared to a larger company, uh, what... What sort of uh, precautions do you think they can do to protect their their identity as well as their designs that they're working on online? Yeah, so, uh, you know, unfortunately, when you're in a position where you have those kinds of, um, you know, where you, where you have those kinds of concerns like protecting your intellectual property as well as your identity, you have to be on the forefront of really educating yourself. To people like us, tools like ours, we're really advocating to make this an easier process. But right now, it's really a matter of really reading those agreements. You know, those things that we just sort of click accept on, no matter what they say, like, you got to go through there and especially look for data provisions inside those agreements, right? right. Um, 
And, and you, again, you just have to be aware that anytime you're using something free, which again, like you point out as a freelance designer, those tools can be extremely useful and valuable for you. Right. But anytime you're using a free service, something is being traded for that purpose. Right. Right. So again, if the, if that product is free, then you're the product. So you have to be very clear about exactly what kinds of data you're sharing in order for that service to exist. And with that, what are three things, I mean, you've kind of mentioned them, but what are the top three things that all designers or engineers, whether industrial, graphic, mechanical, electrical, what, what can they do to better protect themselves online, whether it's ghostery or just common sense or in general? Yeah, so, I mean, there's that notion of making sure that the data that you're trading is you're aware of it. Right. So, and that, that's really sort of on the legitimate side, like in cases where companies are using data collection in order to provide you a free service, there's nothing criminal or anything happening there, but it's, you should be very, it should be very, you should be very aware of exactly what kinds of data you're trading. Right. But then on the security side, there's a couple of very easy things you can do, right? Anytime you have a project inside the cloud, it should be behind a very secure password. Right. And there's a there's actually a kind of cool thing about passwords that people don't realize, which is the length of a password is really is, is the most important thing. So you hear a lot like put special characters and make sure they're up, upper and lower case and there's numbers mixed in or whatever. But really what you end up doing when you create passwords like that is creating something that a computer can figure out very easily, but a person forgets very easily. Right. Right? So if you're, you're better off to create some sort of nonsense um, words in it. So I'm just going to say some words that I see around me right now. So a password like item, uh, Brazil chisel odor is a much stronger password than if I spelled out sort of like, I love mad men, but changed a bunch of characters inside of it. Right? <laughs> so like, so, so, so that's, <laughs> that's one big thing because you're really gonna, you're really gonna sort of stack the deck against anybody who's attempting to do any sort of like, uh, criminal activity if you do that. And then the other big way to do that, and maybe even the most important way to do that is to keep these tools that you're using up to date. Almost always when a tool, when you get like a new update message, which are really, really annoying and they almost always interrupt work and all that kind of stuff, I get that, but they almost always contain security updates. And people who are after your your personal information or possibly in this case your intellectual property are really adept at using those sort of well-worn holes in old versions of stuff, right? So if you can keep your stuff up to date, you're really, really, that's a huge step to making sure that your stuff is actually secure. So it's it's those three things. On the, on the security side, it's make sure your password's good and make sure your stuff is up to date. And then on the, uh, on the sort of more general data management side. It's just keep yourself really aware of exactly what kinds of data you're trading in, in, uh, in exchange for the services that you're using. Well, that is great advice. And on top of that, um, what about, are there any specific tools that go hand in hand with ghostery that you think like, like one password or. Yeah. So, so I recommend a tool. Uh, there's some password managers out there that I really like, like uh, LastPass. KeyPass and, and Dashlane, I always recommend. Um, and then the other tool that I always recommend, which sounds ridiculous, but it's um, you know your alarm clock. Set an alarm for a time that you don't norm that you aren't normally working, and just maybe a couple of times a week, you know. And then use that time to check for updates. Like just tell your computer, like look for updates on the software and install it, so it's not interrupting your work time. Right, but you you have a specific time set apart for 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 making that stuff work. So uh, again, that seems like a super simple thing, but it's enormously helpful measure. Well, sometimes it's the it's the super simple things that are the most effective. It's that elegance in design, right? <laughs> <laughs> elegance in design. Well, Andy, excellent advice. Thank you so much for joining us on the show today, and we'll definitely be checking out Ghostery. Excellent. Thanks so much. Today's episode was brought to you by the new Objet 500 Connects 3 from Stratasys, the world's only color and multi-material 3D printer. Offering incomparably brilliant and consistent colors, plus transparent colors, 
the Object 500 Connect 3 lets you create the most true-to-life modeling possible. Find out more at Stratasys.com. Thanks for checking us out today, and if you'd like to find out more about Andy and Ghostery, head on over to Ghostery.com. I'm your host, Simon Martin. Stay tuned and check in with us next week on Maker Galaxy. A production of EBD Media.